right, good morning, everyone. My name is Alex Wong with the World Economic Forum. I have the responsibility over our global strategic infrastructure initiative. So we're very pleased to have you join us uh, and also this very distinguished panel uh, to talk about what we're calling the life cycle approach. So for many of you who are in the room, that means, of course, the full cycle of infrastructure, not just the buying and the construction, but the operations and maintenance and the funding model. Uh, this is part of a broader theme that we've been working on at the forum for the last three years. We've actually had an ongoing initiative related to fundamentally how do you just get more infrastructure in the ground with all the gaps and all the needs that everyone's talked about. So we've had uh, tracks of work that relate to what we call a knowledge series, so just collecting best practices and case studies on the entire life cycle of infrastructure development. We've had a specific track of work focusing on uh, Africa to try to accelerate the implementation of PETA, the Program for Infrastructure Development in Africa, as well as several country uh, roundtables in Latin America and now looking at Asia. We've had a specific track related to infrastructure financing, including a report related to uh, a blueprint for policymakers on how to make uh, the right policies to attract long-term investing. And finally, we've been um, uh, promoting the concept of, of the need for a knowledge and collaboration platform so there can be a sharing uh, of information to match the supply and demand, the creation of templates. So all of these elements are, are things that many of you in this room and your companies have told us are critical to moving the agenda. Um, we're very pleased that um, those on the panel have been part of that journey as well. And so we're very uh, happy to have the chance to share some of those views and hear your thoughts and questions. Without uh, further delay then, I'm pleased to introduce our moderator uh, and also the chair of our Global Strategic Infrastructure Initiative at the World Economic Forum, Gordon Brown. Well, thank you very much. I, I'm delighted to be in Istanbul today uh, to be at the World Economic Forum to see an audience uh, interested in how we can progress uh, infrastructure across this country and across the region and the world and to have such a great panel uh, with us. Uh, you may have heard the Deputy uh, Prime Minister for Economic and Finance uh, Affairs talking a few minutes ago about uh, Turkey's need for infrastructure in transport uh, and energy in particular. We know there is a huge infrastructure funding gap, uh, about a trillion a year that needs to be bridged. Uh, we know also that in some of the most uh, difficult parts of the world, there is a shortage of electricity, water, sanitation, but we know that every uh, industrial country uh, has needs for transport, energy, uh, and uh, better means by which they protect the environment through infrastructure. And I think we know also that the solution to this cannot lie with the public sector alone or the private sector alone. It is going to be by developing and indeed making more sophisticated the partnerships between public and private sector. Now that's why we're very fortunate today to have a panel uh, that represents this uh, clear need uh, to think about how we can unlock better relationships between public and private sector in the life cycle of delivering infrastructure from feasibility to project preparation to the construction and delivery to the management and maintenance of these uh, projects. On my immediate left, uh, Shuli Kilik is the head of the European Bank for Re Reconstruction and Development here in Turkey. And as you will find out, the European Bank is doing uh, very innovative things, particularly in project preparation in infrastructure. So I'm very pleased she's going to be speaking in a few minutes. Uh, next to her is uh, Uwe Kruger who is the Chief Executive Officer of Atkins, uh, formerly with Texas Pacific, uh, a physicist who's got a great experience both in the engineering and in the finance side of developing infrastructure. So we're very lucky to have him here. He's come straight from the, the other panel to be with us and uh, we'll be speaking in a minute. Uh, we have Takashi uh, Tutui, who uh, once was at Nomura, now is at the Lixel uh, Group, and they have been developing uh, very sophisticated ways of improving the environment uh, through better infrastructure. And I'll ask him sometime about the waterless market, the waterless toilet, uh, which they've been developing, and of course, many energy saving measures that are central to the mission of this uh, company and to the future of infrastructure. And in a minute, uh, we will be joined, and indeed we are joined, uh, completely on cue. Um, thank you very much uh, by Bertrand uh, Badre, now, Bertrand Badri is the Chief Finance Officer uh, of the World Bank. Uh, he's been involved in developing their infrastructure initiative, which I hope he'll say something about in a minute. He's involved in some of the major projects from Euro uh, Tunnel, which uh, I know about from my experience of the United Kingdom, which was refinanced, 
uh, and with Michel Comdesou and great work in Africa on infrastructure there, particularly in relation to water. And his role is to bring together many of the infrastructure initiatives that are happening around the world uh, through his new position uh, at the uh, World Bank. Now, before we start, let's be clear. In the last year, there has been huge advances made in the way we think about uh, and plan to deal with infrastructure in the future. We have, as we will see in a minute, uh, the World Bank's initiative uh, with the Global Infrastructure Facility. We have the G20 meeting in November, where they will approve in Australia a major initiative of all the G20 countries uh, to expedite infrastructure projects and to build an expertise that can be transferred across the world. We have the BRIC Development Bank, which is being formed uh, specifically to deal with infrastructure needs amongst the BRIC countries and related countries. We have the Asian Initiative by China, an Asian facility, which will be announced, I believe, at the APEC meeting in November. Again, an attempt to focus resources on infrastructure in, in Asia. And we had, as I said, EBRD and other initiatives in their particular regions to improve the way we bring public and private sectors together to deal with infrastructure. So this is an exciting time. Uh, there is uh, great progress, uh, and we now need to see what that means for individual companies, individual countries, and for particular infrastructure needs from energy and transport to the environment and so on. So without saying any more at this stage, because you will be in a position to ask questions about how things are progressing. I think I'll start, if, you, if I may, with Shuli Kilik to, to tell us what is happening in Turkey and in the surrounding countries that makes her confident that we are moving forward in developing a better life cycle for infrastructure projects. Uh, uh, Shuli, please, and welcome. Thanks, Thanks Gordon. Um, well, uh, actually, when I look at uh, Turkey and the region, um, I need to really put a, a big differentiation uh, coming from the development stage. Um, and uh, I mean, when we look at the developed countries, uh, at the moment we are seeing a, a global infrastructure stock uh, getting at the mature stage, which means either uh, they need to be renewed or replaced. Uh, but uh, of course, developed countries, uh, considering that uh, financing sources for uh, replacement or renewing is uh, still scarce, uh, in the developed countries, the consideration is more how can be the uh, life cycle of the existing assets can be extended or, um, uh, or uh, still by using the existing um, infrastructure, uh, the current demand levels can be met. While in the developing countries, and uh, including Turkey, but I want to especially uh, distinguish the Turkey from the rest of the region in that respect, and I'll come there why I'm distinguishing, uh, uh, from the fact that although the region, uh, when we look at all the countries uh, in the Eastern Europe, Central Asia, uh, Turkey, and Middle East, and North Africa especially, uh, the infrastructure is uh, underdeveloped, and I need to say that it is not yet there to meet the, 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 the demand and uh, to meet the uh, requirements. Uh, but when, when we look at Turkey, Turkey from compared with the other countries in the region is very developed from the uh, approach point of view, not from the stock point of view. <coughs> In Turkey, uh, when there is a project development uh, by public, uh, what one thing which really Turkey is doing great is uh, they are studying all other examples of the other countries uh, who already implemented various different structures and solutions uh, before coming up with the solution for Turkey. Uh, in order to meet the, uh, the supply side of the infrastructure. Uh, and within very constrained financing uh, resources um, uh, environment. Uh, while in the other countries in the region, uh, we are seeing less uh, sophisticated approaches and more simplified uh, structures simply to meet the uh, demand uh, for the infrastructure. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, in Turkey, uh, while uh, there was 
probably not too many examples of this. In Turkey, the BOT structures have been first start used back in uh, early 1990s with the energy projects, and we have seen the <coughs> PPP structures in a BOT scheme in Turkey in order to meet the uh, energy need of the country. Uh, later, this has been implemented in the airport sector as well. So, uh, and uh, in the last 10 to 20 years, we are able to see this uh, in order to be, uh, meet the needs for the uh, motorway and the, and the tunnels, and very recently in the uh, uh, healthcare sector and education sector. Uh, while Turkey is coming up with these models, um, uh, what they are doing is taking various examples, especially UK is a very good, I think, example from that point of view, how this is done in that country, why it is done that way, and how, uh, what is the difference of Turkey, and how can we implement this in the, in the Turkish market. But whether this is enough, uh, I cannot say that it is enough, just to give you with the numbers, in the world, what I see is uh, there is a four trillion per annum uh, global uh, stock need, and uh, the, with the one trillion uh, gap, one trillion dollar of gap, which is not able to be met. In Turkey, we have forty billion dollar of per annum need, and uh, and unfortunately, we are not even able to meet half of it. And the, the, this is mainly because of the. Uh, scarcity of the financing resources. Uh, and also, uh, government has a lot of other priorities, uh, and uh, uh, including the current account deficit issue. And uh, this is making the job of uh, our uh, Turkish government very difficult uh, to prioritize the infrastructure assets. That's why uh, in Turkey we have seen the emergency of using the PPP structures in a much speedier manner compared with the other countries, simply with the fact that uh, the public was not able to meet with its own resources. I don't know, maybe we can get into details later, but if you wish, I can. Uh, Thank you very much. So you, 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 you've set the, the challenge that Turkey's got to meet the different needs within the region. Uh, and of course, we'll talk later about the EBRD's specific proposals yes. uh, to move infrastructure forward. I'm going to move, thank you very much, to Uwe Kruger, uh, because in the uh, world of um, engineering, this building integrated modeling has been developed, a far more sophisticated way of planning uh, through digital um, asset modeling, uh, meeting of infrastructure needs. Would you like to put that in the context of how you see the real challenges as we, as we move forward, uh, Uwe? Sure, go on, thank you. Well, first of all, um, as we all know, there's the fundamental challenge that we are facing, not only here in the region and Eurasia, but in general uh, across the world, that we have this uh, unstoppable trend of urbanization, that uh, more and more people living in urban centers now, and that poses this challenge to the engineering and construction industry. How do we create truly a holistic approach to infrastructure development? an approach that takes um, kind of best efforts to make best use of the scarce financing and taxpayers' money. And if you look at best practices uh, that have been realized over the last decade or so, some projects stand out. Let me just take the Olympics uh, in 2012 and the UK as an example, a project where the supply chain construction engineering was able to deliver ahead of time and below budget that was allocated. Why is that the case? Because technology played a role, and that was exactly what uh, Gordon Brown was referring to. If at the very beginning of a complex infrastructure project, you start to build a digital model of the asset, and that's what building information modeling, in short BIM, B-I-M is all about, then with this digital model that you create, you could build scenarios how to construct the asset, no matter how complex it might be, more cost efficient and faster. And faster is almost as important or often more important than just the cost to construct it. And think about then the true life cycle approach of it. Once you have this digital model, of course you can simulate also what does it cost you to maintain and to operate this asset. How can you optimize that? Truly thinking from cradle to grave, 
from the very early design phase of an asset to the point in time where it is under full operation. To give you an example, after the Olympics, where we put that in practice, uh, my own company, Atkins, is involved as the engineer of Riyadh Metro. It is uh, about a 12 billion US dollar program uh, in connection with uh, Samsung, the Korean uh, construction company, and FCC of Spain. And the design comes from Saha Hadid, uh, the Iranian architect, uh, which probably most of you are still familiar with regard to the aquatic stadium, which was a fantastic design during the Olympics. Now, this is very complex engineering that you need to do. That's ambitious engineering, makes a statement with regard to public infrastructure. But given its complexity, it is very, very important to do that cost efficiently. So for this $12 billion uh, construction that is going to, put, to be put in the ground in Saudi Arabia, their full BIM, BIM model is used. And there are other areas in the world uh, where kind of state-of-the-art application of digital modeling really makes a difference. And if you think about it, there is no reason whatsoever that in the 21st century, our industry should not be capable to deliver best value for the taxpayer and for private investors. One of the reasons we are going to discuss, I'm sure, later on when Bertrand is talking about the Global Infrastructure Initiative is that we need to create a more sustainable pipeline of bankable projects in infrastructure. And one important, probably the most important ingredient for it is that we do it cost efficiently and that we do it in a predictable way so that financing institutions have a clear sight what it is going to cost, what are the operational costs of the asset, be it a metro station, be it a mixed use entity, be it high-speed train connecting Kuala Lumpur and Singapore. So technology, the digital technology, digital modeling, in short, BIM, building information modeling, uh, will be decisive and an important support to make that happen. Thank you very much. And, uh, with that very exciting uh, view of the future about how we can do things most cost-effectively, let's turn next to the environment and sustainability and Takashi uh, Tutui, uh, your company is much involved in trying to make infrastructure projects more sustainable. Uh, and tell us perhaps about some of the initiatives that you're taking in that area. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Brown. Uh, our company, uh, Lixu Group, is involved in uh, very comprehensive uh, housing and uh, building related things from raw materials and uh, actual products and, uh, you know, affiliated services as well. But of course, you know, our company's activities are limited, but uh, we have many uh, collaborations with uh, other general contractors and real estate companies and even uh, foreign entities. So I'd like to introduce a couple of uh, actual cases, as just like Mr. Kruger mentioned about it. And our successful cases is, uh, one is a Shinkansen. It's a Japanese railway. And it's, uh, you know, uh, privatized. And then a uh, lot of private ideas are mixed with uh, public spending. And we can create a very uh, solid transportation system in Japan. And we, uh, Japanese uh, system is now going to be export it to other nations as well. And maybe a success of, uh, uh, of this is a com combination of public and private uh, factors. For example, you know, stations. Stations have a very high you know, uh, value and functionality. And after the uh, privatization, Japanese railway companies uh, try to make the station more valuable thing for the society, and together with uh, private uh, uh, business activities. And because of this, a huge amount of revenue, additional revenue, were created. And then uh, using this revenue, uh, railway companies put more capital investment for the future. The typical example is a linear motor, linear technology. It's uh, much faster, 500 kilometers per hour and, uh, you know, energy saving as well. 
So this, if this is realized as a practical use, uh, Japanese uh, government and railway companies are planning to introduce that technology by 2025 around them. You know, if this is uh, possible, we can save energy, we can save time, and we can uh, make a much better communication structures. And the second uh, uh, example is, as you mentioned, Olympic Games. Uh, you know, Tokyo is going to have a Olympic game and a Paralympic in 2020. Uh, uh, fortunately, we could, we could win the, this uh, right against uh, Istanbul. Uh, I think Istanbul will succeed the next uh, opportunity. But the point is uh, now Japanese society are very excited uh, to try to take advantage of this opportunity to make a more solid uh, urban infrastructure. So Haneda Airport is now try to have a more capacity and uh, you know, uh, Japanese, Tokyo especially, is trying to reorganize traffic system. But at the same time, as London Olympic uh, suggested us very clearly, we shouldn't use too much taxes or budget for this purpose. So that we should include private monies, private sponsorship to these activities as much as possible. Then, how can we create a win-win situation <coughs> between public and private? Probably, uh, say, uh, naming rights or branding and so forth. When uh, Los Angeles Olympic introduced that kind of concept, I think we can fully utilize the private motivations to, you know, ex ex to exercise their business activities in an effective manner for Olympic Games. Not uh, wasting money or wasting taxes, but we can create much more effective way of Olympic Games and Paralympic especially. And, uh, and the third example is unfortunately we had a big earthquake and uh, our Tofoku region was destro destroyed 100% by tsunami. And now in the process of uh, reconstructions. And in order to make uh, this effective reconstructions, again, Japanese society to try to create uh, collaborations between public sector and private sectors. This could be a not short-term profit for the private sectors. But if we can increase the time span of business, and contribution to the society, and in return, we can enjoy the business in the future, then we can, uh, it's a workable system. So we try to create more collaborative you know, uh, structure, just adjusting the you know, time span of business you know, ideas. In order to make this very effective, very excellent coordinator, is necessary. As Kruger, Mr. Kruger mentioned, someone should coordinate uh, the total benefit of, of the project. So not only short-term benefit, but also long-term, or could be intermediate. So that kind of coordination idea is crucially important for, for us to consider PPP or PFY, I think. And to, as long as we can create there are more sophisticated ideas, including financial structures, including a technology, or including the, uh, say, uh, coordinating power as a whole. I think we can create much better infrastructure for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for your examples of what can be done. And I think people interested in uh, Istanbul Olympics 2024 will take the advice that is being learned as Japan prepares for 2020, and we wish Istanbul well in its uh, future applications to get the Olympics. Now, for an overview, uh, there's nobody better uh, to ask to give us this than Bertrand uh, Badre, as the chief finance officer at the World Bank. He's been working on what's called the Global Infrastructure Facility, and rather than me try to explain it, I shall ask him 
to give us his overview of the challenges we face and what progress he thinks uh, is being made in dealing with this life cycle of infrastructure. Uh, Bertrand, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. I think we are at an interesting moment in time. I mean, for decades, people have trillions of infrastructure which are expecting finance. On the other end, we have trillions of money which is expected to be invested and nothing happened. And year after year, we write reports and notes, etc. and we say, my God, what, what are we going to do? And the trends are not uh, very exciting. If you look at the past few years, I mean, private investment in infrastructure has actually uh, declined. Uh, even if the uh, international institutions like EBRD or ourselves have stepped up, we cannot match this. So we have to, to consider things from a different perspective. And I do believe that today, and it might not last forever, that's why we have to give a big push, probably for one or two years, the stars are aligned. Uh, on the one hand, after the global financial crisis, we realize that infrastructure has become a major bottleneck in a number of emerging countries. It's not, not, not just so much about uh, you know, structural reforms, et cetera, but in a number of countries, you can mention uh, Brazil or India, et cetera, you have to address the infrastructure issue, you have to mobilize money, but more importantly, you have to find projects. I think this is, a, this is the first star which is there. second star is that uh, it's true that you have a lot of money which is searching for yields or diversification with institutional investors, whether they are pension funds, life insurers, sovereign wealth funds, asset managers, etc. So we have to work with that in mind. It, it really brings a different paradigm, call for a different paradigm in financing infrastructure. And that's where uh, I've been trying with the World Bank Group to push for a new approach. So it doesn't mean that we want to uh, move away ourselves from infrastructure or IBRD and others. We, we are, again, increasing our direct effort. But we really want to initiate a platform. And what do I mean with a platform? It's a place where you build a critical mass of people working together to basically work on this new paradigm to finance infrastructure. You will not have, it's impossible longer term, if you want to make this work, to have the World Bank paradigm, the EIB paradigm, the EBRD paradigm, the Asian Infrastructure Bank paradigm, the BRICS Bank paradigm, etc. At some stage, if we want to make the life of investors simple, we have to work together. We have to define together. I'm, I'm not so sure about the world standards, because I mean, infrastructure, by definition, is not standard. I mean, you have as many different things, but you can standardize certain aspects. What is a force majeure, for instance, et cetera. So that's where we really have to, to put people together and work together uh, to make sure that uh, instead of discussing, as I often say, 1.5 trillion of infrastructure gap, we move to 1,500 projects. We have to, 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 to move to projects. And it's very interesting when I discuss that, it's always the same projects that come all over the world. They circle around. And you, so we have to, to, to just create new projects, work on new projects together. And that, that's, I think, for me, this is the most critical aspect. So we have to work on the country by country on the prioritization of projects, on the design of projects, on the preparation of projects, on the structuring of projects, having in mind that, and I'm talking about private-public partnership projects. I mean, this is really the heart of, of, of the matter. Having in mind the idea that we bring them faster and in a better condition in the hands of institutional investors. And again, this, this, is, this is critical. Uh, that these people, whether it's Allianz, BlackRock, GIC, or whatever, you name them, they cannot afford to spend hundreds of, of bips in, in due diligence, et cetera. This is not in their business model. So you have to make it as attractive as possible. They must rely on this global infrastructure facility uh, that the job has been done properly, that the projects have been selected properly, they've been designed properly, that they have the blessing of the international community so that they can just piggyback on this and co-finance. That's where you really attract serious private money and not just, I mean, small tickets, et cetera. The truth is that we estimate you have 70 to 80 trillion of institutional investor money uh, which exists. If it's just a perc few percentage points of this would be directed to infrastructure, that would change a lot. To date, zero. And if people talk about infrastructure, they mean OECD infrastructure, full stop. And even within OECD, uh, as I told Gordon Brown this morning, it's more the UK than Mexico, for instance. So we really have to, to make this a, a new asset class, ultimately, where every institutional investor feel comfortable to allocate 2 to 3 to 4% of its assets to this specific asset class, I mean, having in mind that they think it's been properly done, selected, prepared, etc. So that's really where, what, what we have in mind. In terms of where do we stand today, uh, the board gave its blessing. Uh, I went to the G20 in Cairns last week, and the G20 now is very supportive of that. We will start with a pilot at the end of this year. 
yılın sonunda ben. It's, it, it's initiated by the World Bank, but it's not a World Bank platform. It's a global platform where we want everybody to be around the table and really, I mean, shift the needle a little bit. So we start with a pilot. Of course, it, we're not talking about billions and billions year one, but at least we start so that I hope we can avoid to write another cycle of reports and concept notes on why it doesn't work. So let's try, let's adjust, and let's move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we, we've had the, the overview, we've had specifics about what's being achieved, we've had a focus on Turkey itself and what can be done here. Uh, can I start the questioning before I put it to the audience by starting where we ended with Bertrand here. You talked about uh, thinking of a thousand projects rather than a, a 1.5 trillion gap. You talked also about a, a pilot to move things forward as a public-private partnership. What are the criteria that you can uh, adopt for choosing your, your pilots that will command support both within the World Bank and within the international financial community. How are you going to move to the next next stage? I think people will be interested to know. Yeah, I, I, Please, Bertrand first, and then I'll come back to you. I, I, I think uh, we need to test different things. So I think it's a mix of sectorial approach, of geographic approach. Uh, so we need to, 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 to have uh, and, and we, we think about on the one end transport, transportation, transport, and energy, which are very critical. Uh, but we need to go in, I mean, in, in kind of upper middle income emerging markets, maybe Turkey or Brazil or this type of country, as well also as to uh, less, less developed country like in Africa. So we need to have a mix of different things. Uh, given the money we have uh, at the bank, if I may say, uh, we think about, I would say, four to ten projects in the next two years. Uh, relatively big in size because that's where you want to make a difference uh, and we want to engage with our partners to see what they have in the pipe so that we can really build something uh, which really allows us to test different things. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, you, you want to respond to this, please. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Dekashi. I'm not the expert here, so please uh, allow me to say... Uh, I, I think we're all know, learning. We're all things. learning. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You know, Japanese, uh, you know, companies are now contributing to the construction of infrastructure in Turkey. Say, uh, Bosphorus bridges, or the, you know, tunnel for the uh, subways. And uh, all is possible because uh, Japanese uh, private co sectors have the technology. They have accumulated very excellent uh, bridge and tunnel and railway technologies. However, it is impossible for them to ac access to the Turkish government and to try to negotiate that details. But, you know, Japanese government in this case uh, used official development assistance. It's a loans. You know, by using this, Japanese private companies can, uh, you know, feel comfortable to make a big investment and big commitment. And then, uh, you know, I think Turkish society is also very happy to enjoy that kind of accumulated uh, Japanese technology as much as possible. Then, eventually, we can create a new business opportunity there so that, uh, you know, something, uh, you know, uh, cat cat catalytic, you know, yeah. uh, functions on the public sector is quite important. And by doing so, I think uh, Jap Japan and Turkey relationship will be very much promoted, should be very much promoted in a you know, uh, big manner. And then, uh, sorry. No, no, please, please finish. Then uh, as a you know, successor of Olympic Games, we can conclude contribute <laughs> further effectively to the Istanbul. Well, there you are, Japanese technology, Japanese loans, uh, a starting point for 2024. Uwe, <laughs> uh, can you give me your reaction to Bertrand's uh, uh, view of the global infrastructure facility and what you see as both the possibilities and the challenges that this is going to meet? I mean, how, how do you mitigate the risks uh, through this multinational, national, public, private uh, pilot idea? World Economic Forum, this uh, initiative as such. As you heard Bertrand describing, 
Uh, I think what appeals most to me is that it is a very practical approach that uh, not tries to boil the ocean, but that really starts to with distinctive, specific projects that are conducive to bring private and public money together. Most importantly, in my view, is exactly the approach that Bertrand was describing, that the World Bank, clearly with input uh, from knowledgeable uh, private engineering construction companies, kind of pre-shapes these investment cases. So um, makes it, it brings it in a, in a position uh, that pension funds and large-scale infrastructure funds can actually have a ready investment case in front of them. And this is actually where most of the private-public partnerships at the moment are falling short. It's exactly how it was described, that those funds don't want to spend the money, don't have the expertise to prepare the project in such a way that investment committees can readily decide upon them. So if we want to turn this kind of momentum again, as a matter of fact, private investment infrastructure was um, decreasing over the last couple of years. If we want to turn that around, that's exactly that approach what, that we need to take. It needs a concerted effort of the experts of the supply chain coming together, helping the World Bank to form that, and then we find projects uh, that are conducive for these kind of partnerships. It is also important, clearly, that we find projects of the right size. If you think about the Black Rocks and, and the apex of this world, these need to be projects in the kind of couple of hundred million, if not billion range, in order to make a difference, to move the needle, to merit the attention there. And we need to find, of course, also the right political balance. And it has to benefit uh, both uh, kind of Central Asia, Africa, um, South, South America, and probably Eastern Europe in its uh, infrastructure needs. I'm absolutely convinced, Gordon, that this initiative will make a difference. It will kind of set the tone how um, uh, infrastructure developments between public and private interest uh, can be done in the future and will set a precedence uh, how we can really um, move forward in addressing this enormous infrastructure need uh, given the urbanization challenge that we are facing. Thank you very much. And let's, let's break this down. First of all, the feasibility studies. I think uh, there's a general recognition that you are not going to expect the private sector to come in and finance these. But that is something that the global infrastructure facility would be able to do in itself. Is that right, Bertrand? Yeah, not just the global infrastructure facility in itself. I mean, that's a job of the various public actors, whether they are the, the multilateral development banks, national development banks, yep. government, etc. So that's where the public money is most needed, because this is where the risk is maximum. And then, the, the further downstream you go, the further space you open to private sector. And this is really the way we need to, to, to think about it. Nothing uh, very original, but we want to make it industrial. Uh, and and uh, the, um, the, the, uh, from the EBRD's point of view, you've now got your own project preparation facility. Can you explain? Sure. Uh, I mean, uh, when we look at the region and Turkey, actually one of the things which we, uh, uh, I mean, especially the uh, countries that EBRD is involved, one of the uh, issues that we have come across is that uh, first, uh, governments are in urgency of making the infrastructure investments because the countries they are uh, that uh, developing are fast-growing countries with the, with the uh, immediate need of the infrastructure. And having this uh, emergency need, of course, governments were not able to spend enough money for the preparation and due diligence and uh, feasibility studies, and most importantly, value for money analysis. Uh, this is especially also true for Turkey. And uh, uh, this, uh, on the other side, without, uh, with, with the lack of this kind of studies, prepare, uh, project preparation studies uh, done, uh, if the projects are uh, getting into the development stage, uh, in the long run, this definitely causes a lot of problems with, with the uh, efficiency of such infrastructure, uh, as well as uh, the usage and maintenance of such uh, infrastructure. Uh, having this in mind as EBRD, uh, we are trying to help the governmental authorities by allocating certain donor funds 
to help them, first of all, to get the access to their, uh, uh, get the ex um, access to expertise and uh, those uh, people who has the uh, necessary background and uh, who has the necessary experience in this kind of areas and to help the uh, bureaucrats and the governmental authorities uh, to come up with the uh, right uh, project development uh, process uh, making all necessary due diligences, preparations uh, before any project uh, gets into the, uh, the development phase. Uh, for example, just to give you one example why this is so important, uh, in Turkey I want to give the example of Eurasia Tunnel project. It's a car tunnel, double-decker, uh, the cost is around $1.4 billion. You know Istanbul, probably you had a little bit of time to see around and you see how uh, the congestion in the traffic is. Despite the uh, Istanbul municipalities using all necessary technological intelligences in order to uh, divert the demand depending on where the congestion is or use all necessary uh, structures or the tools or, or uh, systems in order to uh, speed up the uh, traffic flow by having uh, automated uh, toll system, e-toll system in the bridges. Uh, and, and so it is impossible to get rid of the congestion. That's why the uh, Minister of Transportation decided to come up with the tunnel project. And I mean, one of the biggest problems of Turkey is unfortunately because of the geographical and also fortunately because it is one of the nicest of the world, uh, we have the Bosphorus, which is the biggest bottleneck in Turkey for the traffic. And having only bridges uh, is not enough on the one side. And secondly, when you are building the bridges, you are somehow destroying the green areas, uh, somehow impacting the environment, which is also uh, causing certain problems. So from that angle, Minister of Transportation saw that tunnel it would be a very good way of uh, probably creating alternative uh, modes for the transportation. But what they did is, because it was such an emergency, they didn't really do the necessary due diligence to make all the necessary borings and very sample borings only to determine which route would be the best. And they determined like three alternative routes uh, from north to uh, south. And then immediately, without really making also enough preparation for the uh, regulatory part, they start the tender process. But this later on causes problems because first, uh, because there is not enough due diligence done, uh, not all the foreign investors are able to get into this kind of projects, which is uh, decreasing the uh, investor uh, appetite. Uh, uh, thanks to our entrepreneur Turkish uh, sponsors, uh, they are able to somehow take certain risks, so they team up with uh, some international names which are very expert in building this kind of tunnel, so to bring the technology. They took certain risk to build the tunnel, but because the, all the development of the project is done after the tender is finished, until the project comes to a construction stage, another four years has to go, uh, and the construction just started last year. As EBRD, what we are trying to do in this respect is trying to help the governmental bodies, the authorities, to instead of having the sponsor taking the risk, investor taking the risk to make all this necessary due diligence and, uh, and uh, preparations, now we are trying to basically allocate certain donor funds to help them to get the right expertise, right advice, to help them to develop this uh, pretender uh, preparations so that value for money analysis is done to see whether the PPP is the right structure or whether this should be still done by the public and the private only should do the construction. And what is the risks involved if it is done by public or if it is done by private? So to come up with the very right structure and, uh, and to eliminate, most importantly, the long period of time after the tender is completed until the project gets into construction and final operation to decrease this time period. I mean, for example, right now our tunnel project will come to operation in two year time. 
but the traffic is already crazy in Istanbul. So, uh, and in, in between, we don't have too many alternative modes, and the time lost in the meanwhile is increasing the problems in the market. So with this kind of project uh, development uh, initiative we have, we are trying to somehow support the authorities to implement exactly the right uh, way of project development. Marja, Uwe, is that a case for build information modeling right at the beginning? That is for sure. <laughs> um, that, that's a typical situation. That uh, it, it really helps. Uh, again, building of uh, Bertrand's description, how we want to change that with the initiative, that we have this feasibility phase, phase one, where we really think with all kind of technology that we can put in, with digital modeling, with the financial modeling, how can we shape the environment for this project in such a way that uh, we speed up the realization phase, that we find the right positioning for financing to come in, so that we do the thinking in the very first phase of the project helped by EBRD or the World Bank funding, because that's exactly the phase where private investors are not keen to take the risk. And once that is done, once it has been carefully and thoughtfully, then you will see infrastructure projects will come ahead of time and they will come under budget as the supply chain has demonstrated many times before. It's absolutely possible. So this is an example where the government took the lead. It wanted this particular infrastructure project. You, uh, Bertrand, have got a, a series of pilots to choose, almost at, at a global level. How do you make that choice? Yeah, for example, and my question to Shuri is, uh, is, is there any uh, you know, cash flow calculation for the future? I mean, uh, by using the value of the tunnels. Uh, well, there has been, of course, some uh, basic feasibility studies done but, I mean, when we look at Istanbul, I mean, uh, of course, I need to tell you that because it is really emergency need, how detailed those feasibilities are done is yeah, question but mark. I think it should be a huge amount of value is associated with that tunnel. And wow. how can we realize that value for the future? And who will be a coordinator of that? Yep. That should be the question. Uh, so I my question is, is there any one coordinator to, to that issue? If, I mean, at the moment, uh, in Turkey, we have the ministries, Minister of Transportation, which is acting as the I don't think it's authority. impossible official to do that job. Yeah. No, no I, think, I think we could have a completely separate seminar for maybe <laughs> se se several days in length <laughs> okay. about this specific project. Sorry, Mr. Brown. <laughs> no, about this specific project, yeah. and it would be very the interesting point is, indeed. Uh, my point is a concession. We should separate the concession. And so that we can even uh, securitize it yep. for the few, for the global investors. Can I, can I come? Can I come? Sorry, can I come back to the the, 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 the essential question we started with about the, the global infrastructure facility, Bertrand? And uh, here was a here was a project chosen by the government, obviously government having to push it forward, now wanting private funds to come in to, to help it. What about your choice of pilots? Is that going to come from governments? Is it going to come from the private sector? Is it going to come from the World Bank itself? How, how are you going to get to an agreement about what are the most bankable and most uh, uh, cost-effective projects that you would sponsor? And how does that then affect the choice of projects in the future? I, I think the, I mean, nobody can choose on its own. So you, it has to be the result of a dialogue. You cannot force a government to do something. A government cannot force you to find something which is meaningless and so on and so forth. So I think it all starts with, with a, a eye in the eye discussion. And again, it, it's critical uh, to, to be able to discuss a, a priority list. As I think that's the first step. I, I've, been, I've seen many governments which had a huge shopping list or Christmas tree of projects, which, you know, hundreds of billions for the next 20 years. And say, where do you start? So you really have to force people to say, OK, my priority is this one. And this will give comfort to investors that if this is a priority, there is, I mean, a higher probability that they will respect their engagement, et cetera. So I think priority is a first discussion. And it, it should involve everybody around the table and make sure that, uh, I mean, priorities from a government can be driven by economical purpose, but also sometimes by political uh, expectations, et cetera. So you have to make sure that it does make sense. That's, for me, a, a very important prerequisite. The second prerequisite is also the whole ecosystem. Uh, uh, you mentioned the fact that I've been working on Eurotunnel, which was not a PPP, technically it's a private-private 
partnership because one of your predecessors in the UK, Madame Thatcher, said not a public penny in that project. Mm. So it was a technological success and a financial disaster. Uh, but fortunately, it uh, gave me the opportunity to uh, restructure it. Uh, so so uh, PPP is a very sophisticated thing. It needs a lot of expertise. And it's, uh, very often, it's misunderstood uh, by, by the people which enter into a PPP because they think it's just a financing tool. It's just a way to kind of postpone the payment after they are re-elected. So just start and we'll pay later. And the truth is not that. A PPP is about a risk-sharing agreement. So you have to understand what type of risk you want to share, how you want to share them, etc. That's critical. And you just end up invent that. I mean, you have expertise, you have to discuss with people. If not, there are plenty of oral stories. I mean, they have been in the UK, they have been in France, they have been everywhere in the world. And we all know that. So the idea is also to avoid this by, by being able to learn from the lessons from the past and build this, uh, I mean, based on all this experience accumulated. I think for, for me this is really good. So coming to your point uh, on the pilot, it's a mix of, uh, as I say, uh, from a macro perspective, choose the right geographies and sectors to be kind of representative, but as well to operate in a receptive ecosystem where the government is very well aware that it needs to prioritize, that he needs to, to basically work hand in hand with, with, with financiers, and that is okay to have the private sector involved. It's not always easy, as you know, because when you put private sector in the loop, I mean, the taxpayers say, oh my God, you gave them too much money, etc. And, and vice versa, the private sector is very suspicious of the public sector and say, well, they want to kind of steal money out of them. So we, we have to have a mature discussion, which is pretty difficult to establish. Thank you very much. I, I'm very grateful for what you did on the Euro Tunnel because uh, I think it was President Mitterrand who said that uh, we had high-speed travel from Paris to Calais and then across the Channel, and then you had a chance to have a leisurely look at the English countryside because the trains were so slow once you got across to England. So uh, we, we have a lot to do on uh, transport infrastructure in, in, in Britain. Now, Uwe, what do you think about this idea of the pilots, how they're selected? Because this is obviously going to be critical to their success. It is absolutely critical. Um, I think all the criteria have been mentioned uh, before. It is about uh, uh, an adult and serious conversation about the specific priorities governments have in, in high-value projects. It's about projects where we can predict, for example, uh, as my colleague said, traffic flows uh, carefully, uh, having a clear investment case in hand. So having almost carved out three, four picture-perfect cases where we can make the point that this scheme that Bertrand is advocating really works, and that as an industry we can put our weight behind it. I want to make one more point, uh, Gordon, coming back to the life cycle uh, question. Um, that's the headline of the session. Uh, I want to make you aware of the fact that um, it is not only transport or energy uh, infrastructure that we can look at almost from a myoptic point of view. What is important when we talk about infrastructure in the developed and the developing world is that we have a future-proofing kind of sense of it. So designing something today needs to be done in light of the fact that this infrastructure is still functioning 30, 50 years from now. So anticipating the, de the demand, it is extremely important to think ahead in that sense. And there are great examples of infrastructure architecture in the world where that has been done even 50, 100 years ago um, uh, and where we can learn from. And it is about getting many things right. It's about the transport, energy, water, waste, and even the social infrastructure and urban centers that have to come together in this future-proofing sense. We have done a study with the DFID and uh, the University College of London looking at 130 urban centers in Asia and in Africa. And we put criteria in place uh, how this kind of future briefing holistic approach can work. I encourage you to go on the webpage, take a look. And now this is not only theoretical. Um, the government of Nigeria, government of India have asked us to put this in place, this, this kind of all-encompassing approach to infrastructure and master plan development. And that, I believe, uh, as we talk about the pilot projects, we need to embed them in a concept that is a master plan concept of the urban environment in which these initiatives 
are going to flourish and demonstrate that it really works. Thank you very much. Now, I'm going to ask for questions from the audience and then ask the panel to address some of your comments. First of all, here, I think. Yeah, 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 first and then second. Yeah. Thank you very much. If I may, uh, my name is Karl Boschana from Nomura Bank International. Uh, my question is to Mr. Kruger about the digital modeling uh, concept that you brought. How um, applicable and reliable do you think it will be to the emerging market countries? Because what makes emerging market countries is the coexistence of flexibilities and inefficiencies. And just to give you an example, the very airport that you use coming here was finished ahead of time. And I can give you many other examples like that, but at the same time, I, I can give you many examples where very able advisors gave advisors certain projects, and we have seen many significant cost overruns in many projects. Um, I think one issue in the emerging market countries is not so much about um, uh, forecasting the cost and putting that in a model format, but the availability of the resources, especially for countries like Turkey, where the energy uh, shocks, currency shocks, they actually affect the prices, especially for uh, locally consumed uh, infrastructure uh, activities. So how do you think that it can be made possible for countries like this? Thank so you. the idea is you can design out some of the inefficiencies, but there are currency energy, other reasons why cost overruns happen? First of all, to put your mind at rest, uh, Gordon and I can quote a number of projects in the UK and elsewhere in the developed world where it, got, where it went wrong terribly uh, in, for, for very <laughs> same reasons. So this is not a characteristics, I think, between developing and developed. It's about getting it right in the first place. These external effects that you're describing are important but can be considered in the same kind of modeling. I'll give you an example for that. Um, in Doha, uh, the Emir has decided to commission what he called a central planning office, where now the private industry is asked to coordinate uh, the infrastructure development of the country in the run-up to the soccer championships. And one of the, um, the, the kind of external factors that all of a sudden came to light is that with all the construction activity, when it peaks, there's not enough harbor capacity to get the construction material in. So besides looking at just one transportation project, all of a sudden you need to consider the external aspect of getting transport capacity for harbor, for, for the harbor dimension for construction material in. So the energy aspects that you're describing are others one, other ones that are these exogene effects that have to be considered. Now, look, I'm not telling you that everything will be fine and done just to have a digital model of your asset. But once you start scenario planning on the basis of an asset model, then of course it's much e easier in those scenarios to, to consider the external effects as well and have a what-if scenario connected to it. And that also helps you then to delineate, coming back to Bertrand's uh, initiative, to delineate which projects, are most ap which projects are most likely to succeed in a PPP environment, where you can minimize the uncertainty and where you can price the risk, be it internally or externally. So I'm pretty sure that it will help. Did, did you want to come in, uh, Takashi, on this as well? Yeah, I think, uh, of course, uh, my idea is uh, private sectors is uh, based on uh, uh, you know profitability, you know. However, uh, you know recently uh, you know important concept is uh, creating shared value. How to create the shared value with uh, society or the public? Uh, that sort of thing. So that uh, not only short term profitability, but also shared value could be a quite important uh, factor for uh, private, private sector enterprises. So that uh, if the holistic digital modeling is uh, more perfectly designed and could be run for decision making, then uh, we can consider a lot of uh, you know, external factors, even uh, external factors, that create uh, wider uh, creating shared value. That makes project possible, I think. The wider options will be prepared. Thank you very much. And the question 
from here. Thank you. Hi, Jeff Friedel, Zurich Insurance. Um, about four years ago, I chaired the West's Global Agenda Council on investment management and insurance. I'd like to think we were the creators of the work you've done, Bertrand. I'm not sure you were, but it was a specific request. One of the issues that both the investment management and the life insurance industry have is that they need long-term securities, and those just haven't been available. So infrastructure was an area where we specifically wanted to look at it. There were two sets of risk issues. Um, you're dealing with uh, many of the structural issues, how quickly we can move from project finance to securitization is going to be a key part, I think, of your pilots. The, <clears throat> the big issue that we have is, and you just made the same mistake, you mentioned two, three companies. The reality is securitization to work has to be spread over many, many companies, and getting efficient distribution for the securitization on these is going to be critical. The other thing that's necessary for securitization, which doesn't help in every emerging market, is rule of law. And UA, the modeling you're talking about, is what we wanted to see as general insurers for a long, long time. And the better that gets, the more we as an industry can deal with ensuring um, project delay, project uh, um, design errors, and we can also deal with some of the political risk issues, but it's got to get tight. So it's, I guess the exhortation is you're doing everything we want to hear, but you've got to get really tight about the last pieces before it works. May I just comment? Real quick. Yes, one? please, and then Bertrand. You, you, will be, you will be pleased to hear that uh, our Swiss Re CEO colleague is uh, part of this initiative as well. So, so uh, we really took all the work that uh, you guys did in the past and phased it into this initiative. I, I just want to also ask for your understanding that I think what we are after here is nonetheless a pragmatic approach. Of course, from a securitization point of view, you would like to have a vast portfolio that you can invest in. Let us get a starting point, right? And, and uh, that has to do with a lot of practicalities that we need to put in place. And that's where we frankly are in this initiative at the moment, I'm pretty sure as we can demonstrate together that this works in three, four projects, we will easily have a snowball effect where we get a kind of a vicious circle of investment interest, demonstrating that it works, shared risk, shared creation of value, and then we have a momentum going that will, I think, uh, can be very successful. Th thank you, Uwe. Uh, Bertrand, would you like to comment on the securitization point? What you did with the, the Global Agenda Council was part of the alignment of stars, which I mentioned. I mean, things have evolved over the past few years, and now is a time where basically things can or cannot work, actually. But at least we have to use that window for opportunity. Uh, I, I do believe you're right from moving to a project finance, which is a case-by-case -case approach, uh, to a securitization is a kind of ultimate goal. This being said, uh, I want to be realistic. I mean, securitizing infrastructure assets will take ages. Because, I mean, they are what they are. I mean, it's not the kind of uh, subprime uh, real estate market from the US. So we have to probably move to an intermediary step, which is a pooling of assets, which is kind of pre-securitization uh, stage. And I really, this is really what we have in mind, to make sure that people like you, life insurance, et cetera, can invest in a pool of assets while trusting the international community for selecting, prioritizing, designing properly so that you don't have to incur the, the, the due diligence costs, the legal costs, etc., but can rely on people which have done majority of the work, which can provide you with, I mean, important staff which are uh, high quality standards. You, I mean, people are obsessed with reputational risk within, I mean, the World Bank and others. But I can tell you by experience, I've been in the private sector for a while, that reputational risk is, is, is true for everybody on earth. I don't think Zurich would like to be involved in child labor or environmental disaster, et cetera. So you have to make people understand that it is a case for everybody. It's not just the public people. So I think you have to trust the, 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 the platform, whatever its name, that will select appropriately with the right standards. And second, that we also can provide with dispute resolution mechanism. This is not your job. 
You don't want to be involved in negotiating the, 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 the subway contract, etc. This is our job. So that's where you want to rely on us, etc. So I think there is really a win-win proposal. And that's where we want to go. It, it will take a little bit of time. A securitization for me is the ultimate goal. But there, there are interesting uh, intermediary uh, steps behind. So thank you very much. and happy to continue to engage with you and your colleagues. Yeah, can, can I just add uh, our thanks for what you did originally? Do you want to come back on these two points made by Uvi and Bertrand? Only that capital allocation limits restrict the ability to deal with the early financing. So you're going to have to have a lot of players in there, whether you want to or not. And that's the reality of the regulatory environment that we operate in. Understood. Uh, any other questions now for the, for the panel? Yes, thank you. Oui, merci. Uh, Si c'est euh, ministre chargé du développement économique euh, du Niger. There is no, no translation. Okay. Trans trans translation. OK. Je voudrais d'abord féliciter le, le panel parce que pour la première fois, nous avons vu qu'il y a effectivement un mouvement Jusque depuis plusieurs années, on nous a beaucoup parlé de l'importance des infrastructures que tout le monde reconnaît, mais très peu sur les modalités par lesquelles nous allons avancer sur le financement de, de, ce, de ces infrastructures. Nous sommes heureux d'écouter ce que dit la Banque mondiale, qui effectivement pose le problème le plus important pour nous, qui est la question véritable de... Quels sont les projets que nous pouvons financer Est-ce que ces projets sont correctement préparés Est-ce qu'ils sont effectivement au niveau de, de leur rentabilité, de leur contribution à la croissance globale économique, les projets qu'il faut faire Alors, ce que je voudrais euh, dire euh, en plus, euh, il y a aujourd'hui pour l'Afrique en particulier, euh, le problème principal de l'intégration qu'il est de plus en plus pour nous le problème le plus important, c'est de concevoir un certain nombre de projets intégrateurs au niveau régional. Cela voudra dire donc qu'il faut trouver les mécanismes par lesquels on peut investir dans des programmes multi-pays et autant que possible des programmes multi-secteurs. Euh, il est clair que nous avons besoin à la fois de routes, euh, d'autoroutes, mais également d'énergie, Euh, de chemin de fer, etc. Donc il faut qu'il y ait euh, des discussions autour du programme prioritaire, <coughs> le développement euh, prioritaire qu'il faut mettre en œuvre et présenter à des partenaires privés. Alors là, je pense que c'est vraiment le défi important euh, qui euh, devrait d'abord euh, euh, être discuté principalement avec des, des structures comme, euh, comme la Banque mondiale. Il y a bien entendu aussi, euh, au niveau des institutions de Bretton Woods, la nécessité aussi de, de coordonner leurs actions. Parce que si, au niveau de la Banque mondiale, il y a véritablement une prise de conscience qu'il faut euh, faire des investissements de très grande envergure, euh, le débat sur l'endettement euh, du côté du Fonds monétaire se fait aussi dans des conditions qui sont peut-être parfois en contradiction avec les objectifs qui sont fixés par ailleurs. Donc ces points-là devraient aussi être coordonnés au niveau de, des deux structures chargées donc, de l'assistance technique. La, le troisième point, euh, euh, c'est la question même du financement euh, de, de ces infrastructures. Euh, je retiens tout à l'heure la question donc, de sécurisation, de titrisation, Aussi, parce qu'il n'est pas normal que des pays qui ont des ressources minérales très importantes ne puissent pas euh, valoriser ces, ces ressources et qu'il faille attendre que ces ressources soient totalement en exploitation avant de, avant de pouvoir utiliser les ressources, alors même que les infrastructures dont nous avons besoin conditionnent leur exploitation. Donc il y a ce paradigme-là qu'il convient 
euh, de lever et sur lequel nous pensons qu'il est important d'engager de, le dialogue. Merci. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, I, I, I followed this. I don't think there was an English translation. Did people get that if they wanted it? I'm sorry about that. Uh, Bertrand, uh, perhaps uh, you, you, you might sum up, sum up the question for those who didn't. <laughs> uh, no, it was very eloquent. The, the first it. one is of the utmost importance, is a regional approach. It's true that today all the system is structured for bilateral, I mean, discussion with the government, not at the regional level. So we try to move in that telephone. direction, and I do understand, I mean, especially in Africa, for infrastructure, significant infrastructure have a multi-country uh, uh, dimension. Uh, and one of the, uh, of the projects uh, which I, I visited last July was in Mauritania. And Mauritania has gas, natural gas, ahead of Nouakchott. Uh, it's been here for 10 years, but finally we've been able, by mobilizing also the African Development Bank, the various arms of the World Bank, not only to work on, on the exploitation of the gas, but transformation from gas to electricity for Mauritania, and also by providing appropriate guarantee to be able to export that electricity to Mali and to Senegal. So that's really the type of thing we should develop more. This has been sought as a, as a regional approach. So I think we need to do more. It's not obvious, but this is one of the priorities that I've set up from financial perspectives of the group going forward. And Africa is a typical case where we need to do more. If you have ideas, very happy to, to work with you on that. Second point was the coordination within the Bretton Woods institution between the IMF and, and the World Bank, especially when uh, on the one end, IMF might say, well, you are not supposed to borrow that much. Well, on the other end, we try to push for more investment finance by debt, basically. So here again, it's a, it's a day-to-day -day dialogue. It's, it's, not, it's not easy, but we are working more and more hand-in-hand. -hand. On, on this infrastructure facility, I had a number of conversations with David Lipton, who is the number two of the IMF, on, on this, and he, he shared our perspective that there is a bigger picture that we did not discuss here in this room, which is basically the ma massive change in, in the financial landscape in the world. I mean, banks will retreat from long term. They will retreat from complex staff. They will retreat from balance sheet. And they will move to short term, off balance sheet, simple staff. And everybody say, oh my god, good news. We have plenty of institutional investors which, which will just step in and replace the bank. So the truth is that it will not happen overnight like this. You need to help this happen. And I think this is a joint objective that we share with the IMF. And how can we help this transition to happen without too much uh, damage? Because, I mean, the risk is that you, you exit from that at a suboptimal level. And that's a, that's a big risk. And infrastructure is really one of the, uh, the issues where you can have a big damage. Where the banks retreat, we are unable to make the, the institutional investors step in, and then we are just below. That, that, that is, for me, one of my major concerns. Yes. Third point was on, on the capacity to value uh, natural resources. Uh, on top of that, especially in Africa, natural resources are often linked with infrastructure. I mean, a railroad, a port, energy, etc. So I think this is also an area where we should be able, and we are working and pushing my team to work on that. How can we securitize so that we can front load resources that might come in 10 or 15 years from now when the exploitation is up and running to use them right now? And, and final point, which for me is also extremely important, and we did not mention it today, is also domestic savings. Ultimately, the, the key yes. to, to, to yes. finance infrastructure is the capacity to mobilize domestic savings. I mean, natural resources, I mean, which can translate into the creation of sovereign wealth funds, for instance, pension funds, as you do in Turkey, etc. This is critical, because this is the best way to address the currency mismatch. If you don't have domestic savings, you have an issue. And if you look at the, the way Europe and America financed the infrastructure in the 19th and 20th century, it was by mobilizing, sometimes a little bit in a harsh manner, to force people to bring their savings to, 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 to infrastructure. But this is the way it works. So for me, international investment is a, is, a, is, is a way to bridge the gap. But ultimately, we should work on, on building local markets. So we have been a little bit too long. Yep. Thank you for raising these issues about the changing sources of finance. Uh, Uwe, and, and then I think there's a question here. Yeah. The, I think the point you were making about what is the best set of criteria for identifying projects for this program, rest assured that, that we would really like to look at cross-border kind of opportunities in multimodal transport, for example, or in energy, for that matter. So I think please feel encouraged also to coordinate on your side and to come up with suggestions uh, yes. that we were more than happy to, to uh, recognize and uh, to look into. I think you'll find some of the big uh, African projects that have been uh, highlighted by the World Economic Forum in the report are cross-border projects 
where you need to have coordination between the countries on regulatory and other, other matters, and that really is a priority if they're going to get off the ground. There's a question here. Am I right? Am I wrong? Yes, I'm right. Well, um, we've been told that there's a very big gap between, uh, between the demand of funds for investment and uh, what actually is available. But um, my understanding that um, there are a lot of funds from China. And uh, that is why many developing countries, they go to China and it doesn't take much time to realize their projects. So my question, especially to the World Bank, is, um, is China involved in this, in the sense that um, involved in bridging the gap between um, the demand and what is available? Do you have any plans to involve the Chinese? Thank you very much. And uh, that's the global infrastructure facility and also generally, I think. Bertrand, can I start with you here? On, on the positive side, I think it's great that China is mobilizing money for, for, for development and investment. So we should not deny that. Uh, on the other hand, they are also in the learning process. The way other countries are in the learning process. I don't think uh, France or the UK or the US have always been exemplary in the way they lend money to some countries. So we, we have to uh, work with them. Uh, I mean, you mentioned in your introduction, Gordon, the, the BRICS Bank or the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. They are discovering what it means to create a new bank. What type of standards do you apply? Uh, how do you work with others, etc.? So I think we have to help them. They are on the learning curve. Uh, let, let me give you one example. It was very interesting. Last year, uh, I'm sorry to invite you into the World Bank kitchen. We, we have our concessional arm, which is called IDA, where every three years we have a replenishment exercise by which we ask uh, our, our members to contribute money uh, that is used to do grants or concessional finance for the least developed country. And, and China is, is moving from, from a place where 10 years ago they say we are very poor, there is no way we're going to give money to others, to a place now where they start to become one of the big contributors. So we have to help them move in that direction. We have to help them discover what being multilateral means. It's not just being just bilateral, which is natural temptation of every country. So move in that direction. The way they also support the financing reform of the World Bank, and they told me, you know, uh, we will support them even if we have a number of critics, and we know these critics, they have led to the BRICS Bank. Uh, we are a, a responsible shareholder of the institution, so we want this to move forward. So this is where we, we really have to engage with them very proactively and very constructively, and I think it's moving in the right direction. It's not perfect, it cannot be perfect, it will take time, but I think we are moving in that direction. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions? And then I'll ask uh, each panelist to sum up their thoughts for the day. Any other points that people wish to, to raise? OK. Uh, would you like to sum up where you think uh, the discussion has taken us? Sure. Thank you. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I, when I look at it, of course, uh, all this discussion, what I'm seeing, uh, being a person also living in this region, uh, we still need to somehow uh, approach uh, developed countries versus developing countries, uh, for even for the same strategies from different angles. Uh, because there are uh, some particularities of the developing countries which is very different than the developed countries, which comes from the uh, different stage of technology development or different uh, stage of uh, infrastructure development, emergency needs and, and priorities and so. So uh, what I get is, is the outcome of this. There are very good models which are already developed, but while we are implementing this to more uh, developing countries, we need to probably approach more from uh, more tailor-made uh, to answer the specific needs of those countries in order to get the best result out of those strategies. Thank you very much, and thank you for your contribution and my, my best wishes in all the projects you're doing here, including the, 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 the tunnel. The tunnel is too, by the way. <laughs> uh, yes. We finance the tunnel. Uh, Uwe. Yeah, very encouraging. I have to say, I think we seem to be in violent agreement that, uh, that something needs to be done. Uh, that moves us forward in, in combining uh, the need on the one hand side on infrastructure, which is uh, tremendous, both in the developed and developing world, and financing opportunities that we had. I think the devil is in the detail, as always, 
and that needs us to prepare that well, and hence my plaidoyer for A, doing it in a pragmatic way, step by step with these pilots uh, that we were indicating, and second, uh, keeping in sight that technology will help us to better predict uh, both the risk spectrum of projects and the share value that we can create over a full life cycle, so we are in a better state today in uh, addressing those projects and in attracting finance for it with a long-term perspective. Thank, thank you very much, and uh, Takashi. And you haven't explained the waterless market yet. All right, thank you, <laughs> Mr. Brown. Well, uh, our group LIXO is not directly related to infrastructure, but uh, we have noticed today that uh, we are a member of the, the global society, and we have a technology, say, uh, water saving technology or uh, uh, heat you know, insulating, you know, technology. And we are involved in uh, uh, infrastructure, a part of infrastructure, like buildings, uh, housings, uh, or bridges, tunnels, and so forth. So that, uh, you know, uh, having the uh, sharing value with the society, we try to exercise as much as possible so that we can maximize our social value. And uh, uh, as a one example, uh, Mr. Brown kindly suggested, is uh, we have a proposing to Kenyan government that the waterless toilet, and there we can improve their sanitary wear situation substantially, and also we can save water usage. And if this is uh, really uh, you know, approved by the uh, Kenyan government authority, then uh, we can uh, try to contribute in a wide, wide scale to install that waterless toilet there. And also, even for the future, we can utilize that technology to the you know, public places, say uh, schools or possibly uh, in the forest and so forth, so that we can preserve the environmental uh, conditions. So in this way, Although we are not directly involved in uh, uh, social infrastructure, but we try to try to consider uh, what what is the best way to contribute to it. So we learned a lot today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Takeshi and uh, Bertrand. Uh, a lot of the discussion has been about the global infrastructure facility and the follow-up to that. Where do you see things going then over the next year and two years? Well, I, I think for me, it's, uh, the discussion we had today is a confirmation of what I say in introduction is the fact that we have the stars aligned, and it might not last forever. Uh, so I really want us collectively, it's not just us, it's everybody in this panel, everybody in this room, to use that window of opportunity. Because in two or three years, when, let's say, the U.S. Treasury interest rates will be back to 4 or 5%, the arbitration will be a little bit different. So we better move fast. We better start to have people... I mean, diversifying the assets, et cetera, now, because the discussion will be more difficult. So I really wish that we move into action, uh, and the sooner the better. And I think we have a lot of uh, critical mass in this room to, to do that. So I'm, I'm, very, I'm very confident we can make it work. C can I thank on your behalf all the panelists for their contribution today? I think it moves forward to the G20 meeting uh, that is going to take place in Australia in November the Global Agenda Councils that uh, the World Economic Forum is calling together in uh, Dubai in that month as well, and then forward to Davos, where I think we can have a, an even more uh, advanced discussion of some of these ideas that have been floated here today and brought before you. So I want uh, to thank the panelists and thank you as an audience for being part of a, a discussion about how we can change things for the future. Thank you all very much.